Welcome back, everybody, man. Uh, here's another battlefield. We are just cruising around here, and let me get right into it. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera. You're with the American Battlefield Trust on our swing through North Carolina and to Petersburg, Virginia. That's right, they're not that far apart. And here we are on the Aversboro Battlefield. You can call it whatever you'd like, and we're gonna talk about this March 1865 fight. What led us up to this? We were just, you saw our coverage at Fort Fisher, at um, Sugarloaf, at Fort Anderson, at Forks Road, after the Union captures Wilmington. Wilmington. Now, um, per the plans, Sherman, General Sherman, is uh, free to move to the north. He's going to try to confuse his opponent, Joseph E. Johnston, or in this area, um, William J. Hardy, and sort of march on parallel roads. Where am I going? Am I going to Raleigh? Am I going to Goldsboro? Am I heading further east? Where am I going? And particularly, and the Confederates don't know it, but they know they need time to get forces together. So jo Joseph E. Johnston will instruct William J. Hardy, slow down the guys coming down this road. Henry Warner Slocum's 20th Corps and 14th Corps under uh, Alpheus Williams and Jeff Davis, Jefferson Davis for the Union, uh, respectively, okay? So you first have uh, the, the 20th Corps under Williams coming up here, and by March 15th, 1865, the cavalry forces, Judson Kilpatrick's cavalry, I believe it's Wheeler's cavalry, and some of the infantry of Hardy meeting a couple of miles, four miles away on, I think, Smith's farm. And then the battle is really going to start the next morning. Sherman is eventually on the scene here, um, and it's a pretty heady thing. Hardy knows he needs to hold on, give enough time for Johnston, just another day or two, to be able to gather his army forces together. Ultimately, Johnston will get four different armies together to fight in the battle that follows this, the Battle of Bentonville. But this fight sort of devolves, you know, sort of like the Battle of Cowpens or the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, where the Confederates lay out three successive lines of defense in depth, okay? And in summary, the first line, which is pretty far out from here, and then the second line, which is close to here, and the third line that is close to here, the Union will first confront that first Confederate line. It's a pretty even fight at first. And if you look at it this way, you've got Williams's forces with Morgan's troops, maybe on the other side of that road. You'll see a car over there from time to time. And Jackson's division on this side of the road. On the other side for the Confederates, Hardy has McLaw's division on this side of the road. Tolliver looks like Talia Farrow's division on the other side of the road. The Southerners have picked a good spot, blocking the road, Cape Fear River on their right, Black River on their left. Do they have enough troops to connect to the two? No, they don't, but maybe they can make a good show of it by having their flanks anchored. All they're trying to do is slow down the Union. And there is a stiff fight on the first line. The Confederates are holding their own until, and I think you can see it on this map here, do you see how on the uh, Union left here, you have a frontal attack, but eventually this brigade under Case is able to get around the Confederate flank, and nobody holds long under that. When you have superior numbers in front and in flank, you run away or get shot, and by now these men know they want to live to fight another day. The Southerners will fall back to their second position, where the Union senses an opportunity on their right, on the Confederate left, but the Southerners are sallying forth and sending forces forward from the third line, from their reserve. They stymie that Union attack. The Union senses another opportunity on the other side where they try to send cavalry between the Cape Fear River and the Confederate right. The Southerners plug that gap with South Carolinians. Southerners have 6,500 men. The Union is arriving with more soldiers. Jeff Davis's 14th Corps elements begin to arrive on the field at this point, and the Southerners fall back to their third line. Can they hold out long enough? You know, that sun is moving down ever slower as the day goes on. The Union sees more opportunity over there. They try to again get around the river, but there's Joe Wheeler. They dismount their cavalry, cover a screen all the way to the Cape Fear, and they're gonna hold. There is charge and counter charge as the Union is desperately trying to break through with the daylight, but ultimately the Southerners bringing back every reinforcement they have are going to push against the Confederates, I'm sorry, against the Union soldiers, and the Yankees cannot break that third line until darkness, okay? Eventually, William J. Hardy is going to uh, put uh, Joe Wheeler in charge of his rear guard, and he will begin to fall back to join Joseph E. Johnston, um, what is what becomes near the Bentonville battlefield. Hardy, having come from Savannah, is just one of the armies he's going to get. Also, the famed Army of Tennessee is moving desperately, desperately to arrive on the battlefield by the time of the Battle of Bentonville. And we're going to pick this up. So let's hold on Bentonville for now. And then let's walk through this gate, and we will be in part of the lovely, if I may, Chicora 
cemetery here. Chikora, perhaps a Native American name. I'm always worried about how people reuse these things. Um, meeting Carolina. Um, this is a, a, a very beautiful place here. You've got some memorials to some of the troops that fought here. One specifically to McLaws's men who fought in this area. To North Carolinians, South Carolinians. And most of the soldiers buried in this cemetery over here are thought to be South Carolinians. I don't think we know as much about this cemetery um, as we would like to, but they do know the approximate number of dead. And you can see them actually outlined right over there. Another thing I want to point out as we get closer to the road over here is over my shoulder there, you might see a small cluster of buildings and do not underestimate it by size. You'll see some interpretive markers out there. And if you go inside, you will almost always be greeted by a staff that is happy to see you. And then by a surprisingly um, uh, cool and complete collection of artifacts from not only this battle, but from the campaigns in general. I like that little building has some very cool interpretation and a gift shop so you can actually support them. So uh, this, this this Aversboro Battlefield Commission, which has preserved that site over there and along with the state and the trust, we have a real deal battlefield here at Aversboro. So this is probably my 12th time here. I find it a very pretty place and you can pretty easily grasp what is going on here. And the battlefield continues to grow. Chris White, am I forgetting anything? Uh, how many acres did we save here? Yes, I'm sorry. So the American Battlefield Trust has saved going on 600 acres of battlefield land here. And when you add that to the 1,867 acres and growing at Bentonville, we're creating some real North Carolina assets for people to be able to come to uh, and enjoy along with all the other great North Carolina sites that you have here. Um, you know, to be able to enjoy this key battlefield, one that really brought on the largest battle ever fought in North Carolina, the one we'll cover next, the Battle of Bentonville. Anything else, Chris? All right, good. Thank you for your camera work. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education and this trip.